there just something um, beautiful, moving uh, about bells and trumpets and candles uh, and then the beautiful hymns of the faith, uh, the carols? Thank you, choir. What, what a very uh, moving, moving anthem as we uh, prepare to celebrate the coming uh, of Christ, not only as a historical fact 2,000 years ago, not only as a present reality of, uh, through the Holy Spirit, but also a future promise that Christ is coming again to redeem the world and to uh, bring the fulfillment of time. Uh, all of our wildest hopes and dreams will come true in God's great uh, eschaton, God's great time. Uh, throughout this season uh, of Advent, we've been looking at uh, a series of messages called The First Christmas Carols. And what we're looking at is some of these um, songs, these lyrical poems that we find in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. We are then trying to couple some of these uh, uh, first carols of Christmas with some of the more modern day songs that we hear, whether we're in the mall, whether we're in schools, whether we're in church, uh, some of the great carols that we are trying to kind of connect with in time. So already we've looked at the first carol of Christmas through the angels. Uh, singing. We've looked uh, at Elizabeth's carol. Uh, we've looked at uh, Mary singing uh, the Jared led at the uh, 11 o'clock service last week uh, in Oasis. And today uh, we want to end with this first carols of Christmas by looking at Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah's first carol is found in Luke chapter 1. We're going to turn to in just a moment, but a little background is really needed. Zechariah was a priest who lived not far from Jerusalem where he worked at the temple. And one day, uh, the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah to announce uh, part of God's plan for the salvation of humanity and that Zechariah had been uh, chosen by God to uh, help be the father of the prophet of the Messiah, uh, the, the, the young man by the name of John, who was to be given the name of John. We know as John the Baptist. John the Baptist was to prepare ye the way of the Lord, and that Zechariah was to be John's father. Now, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were up in years, and honestly, he didn't kind of believe. He was dubious. He doubted what Gabriel announced, that he would be the father of a son, a son by the name of John. And really, as the story unfolds, he was uh, mute. He did not, was not able to speak for nine months. But then in the naming ceremony, uh, the dedication of John, who has later become known as John the Baptist, uh, Zechariah burst forth in a song that we read about in Luke chapter 1. It's often called the Benedictus, uh, Blessed Be the Lord God of Israel. And it is a song that he's had nine months to prepare for, something that's been kind of forming in his soul. And he kind of sings out, these words. This is found Luke chapter 1. I encourage you to you follow in your pew Bibles. You can few, follow in your Bible in your cell phone. Um, this is Zechariah's prophecy. When his father, being John, when his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he looked favorably on his people and he redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. He spoke through the mouth of a holy prophet of old that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has, prom he has shown mercy, promised to his ancestors. He has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore with our ancestor Abraham to grant us 
that we being rescued from the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation to his people for the forgiveness of their sin. And so, and listen to these words. These words I, I often share at committal services uh, as families gather to say goodbye to their loved ones. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the glow of death, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into a path of peace. This is God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts, Lord, may they be found loving and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Well, this week, uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature was presented to, of all people, Bob Dylan. You know, like a rolling stone. I mean, that Bob Dylan. Yes, Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize in, of all things, literature. He joins the ranks of such people. John Steinbeck, Faulkner. Uh, he joins the, the ranks of, of folks like uh, Hemingway. Yes, T.S. Eliot, Samuel Beckett. Now we can also see in that same phrase, Bob Dylan. Yes. Uh, the first musician in uh, over uh, the 100 years of its existence that it was awarded. And needless to say, uh, to say that it created some controversy at, at the announcement that it was Bob Dylan's prize to claim was, needless to say, an understatement. What you do have to realize is that uh, uh, Bob Dylan himself, he didn't believe that he had been accepted for the honor. In fact, the Nobel Prize Committee, they tried to get a hold of him. He didn't return their call. And then when he finally did announce that, yes, this is real, that you have been chosen to accept this kind of uh, award, he said, well, I'm kind of busy that day. <laughs> and so he didn't come. Instead, uh, he sent someone to read a letter that uh, was read this last week at the acceptance of Bob Dylan's Nobel Prize. And this is what he said, and I quote. He said, If someone had told me that I had the slightest chance of winning the Nobel Prize, I would have to think that I have about the same odds as standing on the moon. <laughs> Bob Dylan didn't believe that he could be accepted for, uh, that he'd been chosen for this acceptance of this award. He didn't believe it. <laughs> well, you know, he's not the first person to have a difficult time believing that he had been accepted. He had been chosen for a specific kind of role or a prize. Uh, and for instance, in Luke chapter 1, we read about another elderly man, probably about as old as Bob Dylan now, uh, by the name of Zechariah. And Zechariah and his wife were way past childbearing years. And suddenly, when Zechariah was doing his duty in the temple, uh, an angel Gabriel appeared and said, Zechariah, guess what? You have been chosen. You are acceptable upon God. And that the prayer that you've yearned for for years, he always wanted a son. Well, um, it finally is to come true. Elizabeth will bear a child, and you will call him John. And you know what Zechariah's response was to that announcement? Eugene Peterson, uh, in his wonderful translation of the message, he puts it this way. You expect me to believe that? <laughs> uh, that was Zechariah's response. You expect me to believe that? And as a result... Um, 
that Zechariah needed some more time to kind of ponder, to wonder, and to marvel about God's saving activity. And so Zechariah was given a gift by the angel Gabriel. That gift is that he would not be able to speak for nine months. You know? In fact, I think there's a lot of women out there that say that might be the best gift we could have for our husbands, right? Not speak for nine months. That was Zechariah. He couldn't talk. And, you know, I've had laryngitis in the past. And, you know, when you talk with... And you're trying to say words, you're mouthing it, and nothing comes out. That's exactly what's happening with Zechariah. And for nine months that's happened. Until finally, uh, the child that the angel Gabriel had kind of promised by the name of John was born. Now, in those days, uh, it wasn't the big celebration of, quote, the birth. What really everybody gathered to celebrate was what they called the dedication of the child. It's usually a week after the birth. And at that point, Jewish men were circumcised and were given their name. Now, when they were given their names, it was always done by the father would present the name. And he couldn't talk. And so they turned to the mother, Elizabeth, and said, what name is to be given to this child? Same thing we do at our baptism. What name is to be given for this child? And they presented, the, the, Elizabeth said, his name will be John. Well, uh, the leaders uh, at the temple, they really didn't trust Elizabeth. And so they went to the mail, to the dad, to Zechariah, and Zechariah motioned for a tablet to write down. And he said, his name will be called John. And instantly, the laryngitis kind of disappeared. He was able to, his tongue was loosened, and he had nine months to think about it, and he burst forth in a song a song of praise. We call it commonly within the church the Benedictus, after the first phrase in the Latin, Benedictus Dominus Deus Israel. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. And he then begins to sing forth really a song of joy, of the celebration of what God has done. Not what God... Uh, you know, not kind of advice for God, but that this is the activity of God. Good news has come. Now, you know the difference between advice and news? See, advice is something that we've got to do. That news is that which has been done for us. And that's precisely what's occurred here. That this is God's good news of what's happened in the world. And he then, Zechariah, proclaims what this whole message of salvation is about. That God has restored covenant to people, has brought them in right relationship. King David has come, the prophets have now. He sings for all these things in this particular song that he says. And, and hear that last phrase. What a beautiful phrase. He goes... Um, you know, by the tender mercy of our God, uh, the dawn from on high will break upon us. It'll give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into a path of peace. This is really a beautiful carol about God's saving activity in our existence. Now, you know, we talk about salvation all the time in church, don't we? And Many of you, some people in church, they can maybe even depict a specific day and time. Well, I, I experienced salvation on June 1st of 1970. Or some people can say, well, I think I'm saved. I've been, I've been baptized. I've been confirmed. I've kind of gone through the loops. I help out at Habitat. That means I'm saved, right? We, we talk a lot about salvation, but many people in the wider culture, they have no concept of what we mean by the idea of being saved. It's something very foreign to them. And frankly, it's foreign to many people who sit in the pews or in the chairs of church. Uh, what do we mean about God's saving plan? Well, let me start by saying what salvation is not. Friends, salvation is not 
The removal of all of our doubts. Uh, that doesn't happen. You know, I, I've been kind of in ministry for many years, and I often have far more questions, far more doubts than I have any concrete answers or, or a sense of firm foundations. Uh, salvation doesn't mean all of our doubts are removed. Salvation also, uh, it, it does not uh, necessarily mean that we're going to be instantly transformed into kind of a modern day Billy Graham or uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, that that's not what salvation is about. It's really a lifelong kind of unfolding process of transformation. Salvation also, uh, it, it, it's also that sense uh, of what it is not that we will have all of our challenges disappear, that our sicknesses will be removed, that all will be right in the world. That's not what salvation means either. Well, what does salvation mean? What is this thing that uh, Jesus is all about, what Jesus has been kind of launching into the world? Well, I think certainly uh, there is an acknowledgement deep in our soul that something's not right not right with the world, not right with our hearts, that we might want to do something and we find ourselves doing the very things that we hate, that there is a brokenness in our existence. There is guilt we may experience, we may uh, have regrets or hurt or pain, that we, friends, live in a broken world and that the line between good and evil, frankly, it runs right through the middle of our hearts. There is a brokenness that all of us experience. What salvation entails is that God has come to bring it together. We call the word reconcile, to, to make right. That God's righteousness can be imparted upon us by our belief. It's not anything that we have to do. It's really by what we want to acknowledge is the source of our energy and our joy, which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is forgiveness of our brokenness and of our sins. And we get that at some level. That, that's something I think many of us in the pews kind of hang with. We understand that our God has come to bring forgiveness of our sins. But I want to kind of go one step more. I think forgiveness is not only, or, or that salvation is not just forgiveness of our sins. I think salvation is also uh, a sense of freedom for uh, God's existence. Uh, Zechariah, he puts it beautifully uh, in chapter uh, two, or chapter one. He says this, that, you know, uh, we are going to be rescued from the hands of our enemies. Why? So that we might serve him without fear. We're not just saved for our forgiveness of our sins, but we are also saved for worship. We are saved for our service to our creator. It's not just being cleansed, that's part of it, but it, more than that, it's about being saved to worship freely, to find an acceptance, to know that we have been chosen by God for a great and holy purpose. We've got to live within that. And yet, friends, many of us, we struggle. We struggle with that idea that we've been accepted, that we've been chosen to receive this great gift. Much like Bob Dylan doesn't return phone calls, we often just doubt it. And why is it? Why is it that we have such a difficult time accepting the fact that we are accepted? Why? Well, I think at one level, we live in an environment, we live in a world surrounded in condemnation and criticism. Isn't our world so critical, so demeaning, so judging, and that we take that upon ourselves and we think that's how God is? I, I got a good friend of mine, he's a, a pastor in another state, one of the most extraordinarily gifted people I've ever met. I, I mean, he was an all-state football player, great athlete. Uh, he was a graduate of Yale uh, he's a Yaley. Uh, he uh, is a published author. Uh, very gifted, charismatic kind of person. And yet, he'll be the first one to tell you that the thing that he hungered most for in his life 
was the idea that he was acceptable to his earthly father. His earthly father was a, a smart man. He was a doctor. Uh, had a very successful practice. Had a lot of expectations, though, he placed upon his children. And it seems like none of those expectations were ever realized well enough for my friend. Nothing he ever did was good enough. And so as a result, he was always striving to kind of make the next goal. And he talks about how while he was in his 20s, uh, he had graduated from Yale uh, undergrad, Yale Divinity, and uh, he was out serving a, a congregation that he had just started. Things were going well. He was a pastor. And he decided, you know, uh, I, I feel passionate about a certain issue, and as a result, I'm going to run for the state house. He's going to run for the state legislation. And he's a pastor. But this congregation supported him, and so he uh, decided to run. Now, he had to run against an incumbent of over 20 years. He had to run for a political party which was in a far minority in the state which he lived. He knew it was a hopeless race. That was not his point. He wanted to kind of highlight some issues. And so when the first um, kind of poll came out early in the campaign, he was down by over 40 points. He was. But as I mentioned, my friend is charismatic. My friend is very gifted. And as a result, uh, he kind of began to rise. He began to get into debates, bring to light some issues. Press began to cover him. And then another poll was released about a month before the election. He was down under 10% kind of difference. And he kept closing the gap. Finally, the night of the election came. They were all gathered for a rally. His mother, his father, his siblings were all there for my friend. And the results poured in. And as it turned out, my friend was defeated by 4% of the vote against an incumbent over 20 years. <laughs> and my friend was thrilled. He thought, wow, this is great. I did wonderful. I brought to light some of the things I care about. Uh, got my name out there. You know, got a lot of positive publicity. Yeah, this is great. And he tells a story about how his father looked at him and said, oh, well, we'll do better next time, won't you, son? You'll, you'll win next time. It was at that moment that my friend realized that there was nothing he could do to help him be acceptable in the sight of his father's eyes, his earthly father's eyes, and that he had to come to peace with that that there was no mountain he could climb, no hurdle he could conquer, no accomplishment that it could occur that would really have a sense that his father would say, it's good, it's acceptable. And, and I think, you know, my friend's not unique. There are so many in this world. We live in a critical, we live in a condescending and a condemning world. And so many times we take that upon ourselves. Maybe we don't get affirmation from our earthly fathers or mothers. And as a result, we don't think that our heavenly father can provide that sense that you've been accepted. You have been chosen. Everything you've done is right and acceptable in God. It's, it's not something you have done. It's really what I have done for you. All you have to do is to receive it, to accept the gift that has been poured down upon you. And yet, we often, as believers, not only do we live in a critical environment, we always want to paddle our own way, don't we? We want to earn it. We want to have it something that is due to us. To be right with God, we feel that there's hurdles we have to jump through or, or things that we have to have happen in our lives. But friends, grace, God's amazing grace, God's gift of salvation in our lives, there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. Nothing you can do to make God love you more. It's really merely about accepting that which has been freely offered unto you. Salvation is by grace. It's not by anything we can do on our own. And I've told you many times, this is one of my mantras of Pastor Brian, that the national anthem of hell is Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. 
And if you're out there saying, well, I'm going to do it my way. I'm, I'm going to do it by my own efforts. I'm just going to work harder. I'm going to be faster. I'm going to be uh, uh, more uh, resourceful in business. And then by doing all that, I will get to where I want to be. And friends, if that's how you want to live your life, if you want to do it your way, <laughs> I'm telling you, I know what your ultimate destination will be. It'll be in hell. Because the, na the national anthem of hell is I did it my way, okay? You have to be willing to receive what God so freely wants to bless you with and just to accept that gift of God's amazing grace. So not only do we live in an atmosphere of condemnation and criticism, not only do we want to kind of paddle our own way into right favor with God, but then I think at a foundational level, all of us kind of hunger for an experience, an assurance of God's salvation within our soul. You may come to church every Sunday. You may put your offering in the plate. You may help out at Habitat. You may go to our family kids camp. And yet, for many people, there is a deeper sense that I just want to have an assurance that I'm saved. I want to know that God is right with me and, and we yearn for that. We hunger for that. And yet, uh, that often comes in, in kind of ways that we don't often observe. T.S. Eliot, who um, did des deserve, by, by the way, did win the Nobel Prize in literature. T.S. Eliot was perhaps the most gifted Christian poet of the last 100 years. And, and T.S. Eliot, he kind of describes it this way as a follower of Christ. He goes, you know, there are only hints and guesses. Hints followed by guesses, and the rest is prayer, observance, discipline, thought, and action. You know, friends, um, there will be those times and seasons of life when maybe our prayers will not be answered as we think they should be. There will be the times when maybe our spiritual life will be a little dry. Maybe it'll just seem like we're going through the motions. And we want an assurance of God's salvation, God's blessing in our journey. And friends, what I have to say is that if we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear those little glimpses of grace, those little thin places between earth and heaven, we can begin to see how God is gently and lovingly working our way into the fabric of our soul to be a blessing, to help cherish us. You know, uh, we've been doing this series on the first carols of Christmas, and perhaps the carol that is one of my favorites was kind of written by a man by the name of Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley, he also went through a season in his life where he wanted an assurance of his salvation because, you know, he had tried it all. He had tried to be a missionary, and that didn't give him that experience. He, he tried to form a, a weekly prayer group, and that didn't give it to him either. He, he kind of got into that lot, point of life of despair that maybe God didn't care about him, that God wasn't answering his prayers. And finally, he, he went through this experience where he just was wanting to receive that which God had offered. And he, he just, it was like the light bulb came on and began to realize it's all about God's free grace. Not anything he can earn, he just has to open up to help come into his existence. He began to write. He began to write poem after poem, carol after carol, song after song. Many of them are found in that little red book that's found in uh, the hymnal we call, written by Charles Wesley. Perhaps the one you're most familiar with. I'm pretty confident you all know it. Uh, he wrote uh, to describe this power uh, of what God's salvation plan is all about. It's hark the herald angels sing. I remember it because I heard it every Christmas. Uh, not so much at church that I remember. I remember it listening to the Charlie Brown Christmas special. After Linus had said, what is the reason why Christmas is all about? And he quotes the story out of Luke, and Charlie Brown still a little falls down. He kind of, he's depressed, and he goes down to Snoopy's doghouse, and his friends kind of gather around him. And, and all of a sudden, he kind of gets it. That it's just about receiving what God wants. And what does he do? They sing, don't they? Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. 
It is perhaps the richest and most um, thoughtful of all of our Christmas carols. Hark the herald angels sing. Just listen to that phrase. Things that we often just mouth and we don't really realize it. But, you know, glory to the newborn king. What? Peace on earth. And what? Mercy mild. Not condemnation. Not criticism. Mercy mild. God and sinners what? Torn apart? No. They're reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim what? Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory be the newborn king. You know, friends, um, we uh, gather this Sunday uh, to proclaim good news. That God is merciful. That God is one who's in the business of reconciliation. God's in the business of peace. Peace to our soul. Peace to how we live as community. That is God's great desire in our lives. Are we willing to receive that which what God so freely offers? I'd like us to pray. Lord, um, many of us in this room We struggle with that idea that we've been accepted. We hear the voices of condemnation. We hear the voices of criticism. And we think, you know, it can't be me. I'm not worthy. And yet, you come not to give us advice about this is what you got to do. You come to give us news that we are free free when we turn to your grace and your mercy. Lord, sinners are reconciled through mercy and peace. Lord, help us to absorb it into our soul. Help us to know it in the very depth of our spirit. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. We talked a little bit about Hark the Herald. I now invite you to uh, stand if you would, please, and join in singing Hark the Herald. Now, Julie, go, stand up, stand up. Uh, Julie will motion when we're to sing. There's like a little kind of introduction that the bells will be doing. But then uh, Julie will turn to us and we will sing that great, great carol uh, of our faith. Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
glimpse of heaven right there. It's good. Um, just a reminder that after all the services, we'll have a prayer partner back and the chapel located underneath the balcony. Maybe there's been something that's come up in your life this week, just like a word of encouragement and prayer. That ministry will be made available to you. We hope we'll see you all sometime this week. You got a lot to choose from. Uh, you can Friday night, uh, four times on Saturday or uh, next Sunday at 11 o'clock. Receive now this blessing and this benediction. Our Lord, send us forth from this place to celebrate that gift of, celebration, or of salvation that you so freely impart upon us. Lord, help us to go out into our homes, our schools, our workplace, and our community to shine Christ's light for all. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.